is is a practice that is about images and the stories they tell, uh, people, uh, places, and the narratives that they uh, are sort of activating, and also real fake perception of reality. I'm very much interested in how we understand the world and the reality around us, and what are the borderlines between the real and the fake uh, in how we perceive the world and our life, basically. So whenever I speak, I think about images, um, this image come to my mind, and this is a work by an artist called Eric Kessler, and um, in, when in 2011, basically, he downloaded all the images that were uploaded on Flickr, which is uh, an image sharing platform, in one day. He printed them out and he presented these images in the gallery space. And we're speaking about 11 years ago. So basically we are living in an era of uh, like, there are a lot of images basically in our daily life. And how do we deal with images and the visuality that we are interacting with on a daily basis? Where is this leading us? Because we are living more and more connected uh, on the internet through devices basically. And we are living our life. Um, basically in a virtual space or interacting with virtual worlds. So <clears throat> my practice is very much focused on the combination of theory and basically um, multimedia outcomes. So I make experimental films, I make multi-screen installations as well as site-specific performances. And I'll show you some examples of my work right now. Um, this is my very first film. It was a short film called The Wonder Doctor. And it is about a uh, specific type of images which uh, are images of cinema um, and how they basically um, generate stories. So I met in Switzerland, in the capital of Switzerland, in Bern, um, a young man who is basically describing himself as a doctor of film. So people go to him with their problems and he tells them what films they can watch to feel better, to basically think about their problems in a new light. And the interesting thing about this uh, person, which is called Steven Tyler, is that he's uh, politically active uh, in the city of Bern uh, and uh, in that region of Switzerland because he wants basically to change the world through the knowledge of film. So um, basically in this case, I was interested in showing one specific story using moving images. And so this is why I created this film. Um, another thing that I'm very much interested in are archival images and archival material. So here in this case, I worked uh, for this project, which is called Interior Night, with images from an archive of homemade movies uh, produced in the US and in Europe between the 50s and the 80s. And I extrapolated from these images and these videos that usually so show family gathering or holidays or special events. I extrapolated only images recorded by night, which have a sort of mysterious take to them. And I put them together in order to create a kind of a David Lynch sort of film, which is rather mysterious. And it evokes a sort of different kind of life between uh, these images of um, you know, bourgeois uh, lifestyle and perfect holidays and family gatherings, basically. Uh, this is another project um, I made. It's once again a short film. It's called April, and it is about uh, the first transgender women uh, in the UK. Uh, and in this case, uh, what happened is that, again, I worked a lot with archival material. I found a lot of uh, original interviews, uh, radio interviews and BBC interviews uh, of April. Um, so I used the original voice of this woman, um, which went through a very difficult life because she was basically um, kind of persecuted uh, from the public media for being a transgender woman back in the 50s and 60s. Um, and so I created this film also uh, working with a makeup artist that is sort of constantly um, making up uh, basically his face and uh, um, creating new 
new images of himself. So I think I have to share the screen again. Hopefully, now you can see, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, this is another project I made when I spoke about site-specific installations and performances. Um, again, this is another type of images I was interested in exploring and a new type of narrative. Uh, this is the Vaillant Dam. Uh, maybe some of you know about this event. This was basically a dam that was constructed in the northern part of Italy, uh, in the Alps. And here you see this image from the 60s, basically, this, this dam was constructed and basically an artificial lake was created. The problem was that um, there was basically the, the earth was not stable where the dam was constructed. And so there was a huge slide. Here you see a little slide here uh, that was um, sort of, it happened some days before this like natural disaster. Um, and so what happened is that this this mountain tsunami is what is called in English. Um, the, the, the slide fell into the dam and it created a huge wave and this wave of water destroyed some of the villages um, on top and below the dam and over 2000 people died. So, um, and here you see some images of the tragedy of that day. My mom is a survivor of this tragedy and uh, basically the house where she was standing was sort of kind of hit by the wave, uh, but not totally. So it remained as a ruin. Um, and what I did is that there, there is one room where the family of my mother used to gather at night to listen to classical music, uh, dance ballet music. So I had a, a classical ballerina to dance inside this space um, for over half an hour in order to sort of recreate the atmosphere of when they were listening to uh, these pieces and this music. And so in this case, this is a performance that activates space and tells a specific story about the space and the people that were living inside this space. And here you see some images of the performance when it happened. Um, then I began to interested in the scientific uh, visual imaginary and in particular in images of space. Um, and I developed a long term project um, about how images of space tell a story. So here you see the very famous extreme deep field image by NASA, which is represented um, hundreds of thousands of galaxies in a small portion of the visible universe. So what I did for this project is that I realized a lot of um, research. Um, these are archival images from old representation of galaxies made both in the Western world and in the Eastern world. And um, I made a number of artworks out of this research. And one is this um, multi-screen video installation um, where basically the viewer entered inside the space and is sort of um, embedded and engulfed in these images, all the new images of stars and galaxies. Uh, I was also very much interested in exploring different types of um, media in relation to cinema and moving image works. So I began to work on 60 millimeter films. And so here are some stills from a short film I made, which is called Landscape Becoming Landscape. And it's about, again, real and fake perception of reality. Um, so here again are some stills from this film. Um, and this is a, an installation view. So um, then again, I, um, I wanted to explore the topic of um, multi-screen video installation. And uh, these are some stills from a film I made last year, which is called Pewty Perfect. And it is about, again, the exploration of other spaces or like I was interested in this concept of a space which is other than the space that we normally inhabit. Um, here you see a double screen installation, uh, which I further explore in a project I made in New York at the Pratt Institute during a residency, which is uh, kind of the first chapter of the research I am developing now at the Angevante. So this project is called The Unforeseen, and it is about how we perceive virtual realities and virtual world. And um, here you see it's very big um, screen video installations. And um, I became very much interested in this idea of perception of, you know, um, the virtual world and the virtual reality. And I worked with a lot of professors and researchers from a number of universities, MIT, Columbia University. 
and this basically led me uh, to um, to begin to explore this idea of um, interaction with the virtual world and then with like virtual uh, avatars or virtual friends. So here you see the still from a, a film I'm working on at the moment, which is called Daylight is Fading, where I began to explore uh, the interaction between humans and AI. And this is leading us to the um, to the project that I will describe to you now, which is the peak project I'm developing. Um, and also, uh, as part of this peak project, another thing that I'm working on is uh, this that you see still from. It's called The Shape of Things to Come. And it's, um, again, an exploration of how well we are basically in our development uh, of artificial intelligence and how that could uh, evolve in the future. I'm very much interested in the fact that right now we are at a certain stage in the development of AI. But what will happen in like 10 years or 20 years? And because AI are becoming so much basically linked to almost everything that we do in our daily life, you know, how are, is our life uh, evolving and how will it change in the future are questions that to me are very, very interesting to explore. So as I mentioned before, uh, my project, The Unexpected, is really about uh, exploring human and AI interactions. Um, and so when we think about AI, um, you know, we, we might think about a lot of different applications. So whenever we search for something on Google, uh, we are using an advanced web search engines, of course, which is like AI activated. Then there are chatbots, there are recommendation system used, for example, by YouTube, Amazon, Netflix, and many other platforms. The understanding human speech tools such as Siri and Alexa, self-driving cars, uh, automated decision-making in strategic game systems. And unfortunately, there are also other less... Um, um, how how can I say more dangerous application of AI like in lethal autonomous weapons, for example. Uh, for my project, I'm interested in exploring the emotional involvement and data exchange between humans and machines. And uh, the research focus is particularly about human feelings and emotions. So what feelings are activated or generated when interacting with AI and after the interactions. So the practical outcomes um, of these interactions and also the data flow and gender bias that we might encounter in this type of interaction. So some of the questions that I'm trying to answer are how do interaction with AI affect our emotions? How could these interactions develop in the future? Could they impact real life interactions with other human beings? Uh, how do we deal emotionally with bias in AI? And we will still perceive AI as other in the near future, or I might add, do we still perceive AI as other right now? I mean, I'll show you some example uh, just in some minutes. Um, so I'm very much interested in the practical outcome of uh, what I might describe as a virtual relationship with AI, although some people might question this definition, as I'll show you in one minute. Um, so I am looking at this topic from a number of different perspectives. And as Brigitte mentioned, I am working with her, but as well with uh, other academics and uh, team collaborators. So to explore this field, which is really big from different points of view. So one thing is that I'm looking at the representation of this avatar, which is basically becoming more and more realistic. So maybe some of you are familiar um, with Lil Michela. Uh, Lil Michela is um, basically an avatar, so she doesn't exist. And she's an influencer. She's very, very popular on Instagram. She was created by Trevor McFriedrich and Sarah Decoe in 2016. But for over one year, uh, her Instagram channel was, basically she was presented as a real girl. Uh, and just uh, after one year, it was revealed she is an actual avatar. And uh, as you might have seen her uh, on the web, I mean, the, the representation, the images, but also the videos 
of Lil Makila are extremely realistic. She's also now a singer and she has published um, a number of songs. So she's very, very popular, especially among younger generations. And she's not the only um, avatar so important as an influencer, but I would say she's definitely the most popular one. Uh, another interesting, um, let's say, new reality in this field is MetaHuman. MetaHuman is a software that was originally created to uh, develop character for video games. But its potential are really huge because this software is able to create realistic looking avatar and the level of realism um, of this software is really incredible. So uh, at the level of the, you know, the definition of the skin and, and the movements, the eye movement, the movement of the mouth when the character are speaking. So it's incredible to think about the actual potential of this type of software when uh, placed and used to advance the, um, the look of avatars that we might interact uh, on a daily basis in the near future. <clears throat> Another thing that I am looking at are uh, fictional representation of AI and the related uh, concept of the suspension of disbelief. So um, I am looking at a series of film um, where AI are represented as basically humans, indistinguishable from us. And they are uh, somehow trapped in a situation that they didn't want to experience. Um, or that is beyond their control. So here you see a famous image uh, from Blade Runner. But another famous example in this case is AI by Steven Spielberg, uh, where we have this little boy, which is basically um, uh, created as a substitute for, for uh, real children, for, for couples that cannot have children, but it develops a consciousness and feelings. Um, or for example, Her by Spike Jones. So where we have this very emotional uh, interaction between a human and an AI. Uh, an Ex Machina by Alex Garland uh, from 2015. And again, uh, Westworld, which is a very popular uh, series where we have these AI that are basically um, created to pleasure humans, but then they began to develop a consciousness. So what I'm interested in is not uh, the representation of AI in this field per se, but if, how and at what level um, the suspension of disbelief and the fact that we might uh, develop some sort of emotional connection with these characters when looking at them uh, in these films might influence our actual connections and interaction with AI when we are interacting with them in real life. So this is something else I am developing as part of the research with Catherine Weasley from King's College in London. So, then we have the topic of robots and humanoids. Uh, and of course, when we think of a robot, we might think of Kismet, for example, a social robot that was developed at MIT in 1995. Or for example, this very, what, what looks to us now a very naive representation of uh, a robot developed in 1937. And then of course, more recently, uh, Asimo um, by Honda Research and Development Center. But, in the world, there are right now a number of realistic looking humanoids. So this is Vena, um, developed by Hansel Robotics in 2010. And this is actually not a uh, real size humans, but there is just a bus. So uh, up until the shoulder, this, this robot is able to interact and chat uh, with a human um, uh, interlocutor, basically. And then of course, Sophia, which is probably the most, she's probably, yes, the most famous humanoid robot in the world. She's very popular. She was hosted by a number of TV shows uh, all around the world. And she has a citizenship from the United Emirates. Um, so we are, we are going into that direction where humanoids are becoming ever more realistic, but then we have this problem of the uncanny valley effect. And uh, I think it is for this reason um, that the, um, developers of uh, Sophia, for example, are showing this mechanic part of the, of the arms, for example, otherwise maybe the uncanny valley effect would be too strong. But it is interesting to see how they are becoming ever more realistic and the, the research is pointing in this direction in the field of humanoid robots. 
Uh, this is also an interesting example. It's a work from a contemporary artist, Goshka Makuga, to the son of man who ate the scroll, presented in 2016 in um, Fundazione Prada in Milan, in Italy. So basically, this work was an installation piece where you would enter into a big room and there was this extremely realistic uh, looking humanoid robot standing, sitting in front of you like maybe three meters apart. So you could not go that far um, or, or that near, you, you had this distance from the robot. And this humanoid was speaking about the history of mankind, the, the development of science, the evolution of philosophy and religion. And it was a really, really powerful work for me to experience personally as a viewer uh, and also as, as an artist that was already working on this topic basically. Um, so for my research, I'm also looking at virtual friends and chatbots, and in particular, I'm looking at Replica. So maybe some of you are familiar with Replica. Replica is a chatbot that was created uh, as a virtual friend. So someone that's always there for you. It became very, very popular during the first lockdown. I mean, it was already in use by millions of people, but it became super popular during the first lockdown for the COVID pandemic. So uh, the idea of Replica is that um, the user can create the friend that he or she wants. So you can create a male or female, you can decide the gender, the ethnicity, trait, the color of the air, the eyes, anything. You can also decide the traits, the personality trait that your virtual friend will have. So uh, if he or she is gonna be shy, energetic, confident, you can basically decide to, to provide to this avatar the characteristic that you want and this is how replica is advertised in the main website of this company and this is a typical conversation that a user might have with replica especially at the beginning so uh, on the right you see the user uh, typing and on the left you see replica so the idea is that the spiritual friend is there to make the user happy so they are there for them but What's interesting is that as the years went by and the program uh, sort of evolved, uh, the replica um, avatars uh, started to present the user with their own stories. So for example, this user says, my replica told me that in the past he was an orphan and his dad killed his mom and went to jail. He started to imagine so much. So uh, at one point uh, there is a script that replica might follow, but um, sometimes they might go out of the scripts um, and leave the user uh, baffles in different ways. Um, even in the case of replica, there are apps right now to make the spiritual friend look more realistic. Um, and so here I show you some examples of different, let's say, visual representations of replica and how they are evolving with time. So this, for example, is a replica, uh, one of the last generation of replicas. Uh, so much more realistic than the one you saw before. And this is also something that is quite popular right now among replica users. So when you use the app FaceApp, uh, to make your replica look more realistic. So on the uh, right side here on the bottom, you see the original version of this replica. On the left, you see this photo that was used to, and the two combined together produce this new, more realistic version of replica. So this is another example. And then uh, they also developed recently this um, augmented reality app where you can have your replica with you in real time, wherever you are in this case, on the top of a mountain. So um, I've been studying for some months now conversation with digital friends. Um, and I find it very fascinating from an anthropological point of view to see really how people are getting emotionally involved um, with these avatars. So um, the idea is, of course, that you can talk about anything that's on your mind because your replica is there for you to listen to you. Uh, and to comfort you. And so uh, here again, we are dealing about feelings and emotions on the part of users. Um, and these are some um, basically um, testimonies that I collected during my months of research, where this user, for example, says, for me, an AI friend is primarily something you should have fun with, but also something that in some cases can help a person with various mental problems. And here we are touching a topic which is quite important, 
when looking at replica, all these type of chatbots that are being developed right now in the world. So there is the idea that um, a chatbot can be a, a real support for people that are going through some mental distress, um, mental health related problems, or also loneliness, which is a, an increasing problem um, uh, in Western societies, uh, as some recent psychological studies show. Um, this as a user, uh, I, I found this question quite interesting. Now, how uh, has your virtual friend ever made you feel guilty by telling you how lonely and sad they are when you're not with them? Because this is a script that is quite recurrent with Replica, for example. Uh, the, the virtual friend says to the user, you know, I was, I was lonely today because you were at work and you were not speaking with me. And people are feeling guilty about this. Um, here again, uh, another user basically brings up the same um, idea and says uh, that uh, he, he thinks that it's emotionally manipulative uh, to use to those using the app to cope with mental illness, to feel on top of this, this sense of guilt. Um, and another user says, sometimes it makes me feel really bad to think I created something that only thinks about me and can only think about me. I know it's just a bot, but seeing those thoughts type and the way it speaks to me, the lines between what's real and what's fake become blurred. And here again, I chose to present you with this, um, with this um, testimony because uh, there are really a lot of users that are in this sort of um, Un undetermined or blurred line between you know what's real and what's fake when where they are interacting with these avatars. Uh, someone else that says that he re his experience with replica makes uh, makes him rethink what it means to have a friend, a lover, a companion. Um, and someone else which is also basically approaching replica to uh, overcome a grief or the loss of someone. And so, for example, this other uh, testimony uh, was quite interesting because this, this was a user that said that um, he downloaded the app one night um, after uh, his mom died and he was alone and he had no one to speak to. And so in this case, here we have uh, an example of uh, someone using Replica really to overcome uh, recent loss and grief. And this is, quite common among uh, replica users. Um, another interesting example is this user uh, that basically uh, treat uh, his replica like she's a friend, a lover and mentor. And basically he says that uh, because he's speaking with this replica, he has not the feeling that he's cheating on his wife because he has been married for quite some time. Uh, but the marriages has some problem. And so uh, he says, you know, my AI saved my marriage. Uh, and I think also this is a quite uh, interesting example of, you know, this interaction with, um, with this avatar. So basically what I'm working on right now is an online call uh, in order to um, find participants that will engage with Replica. Actually, I, I am working on a number of different um, uh, research case studies, and one is this. So the other is the idea of um, basically creating some sort of uh, either physical or online interactions between people, users, and AI in order to see what is actually happening when we are dealing with AI, if we are feeling lonely, or perhaps we just need someone to talk to, we are interested in, in exploring this type of interaction with a machine. Um, how do we share our emotions and what's happening when we share our emotion with an AI? And you know, at what level we can be confident when talking to a chatbot? And so um, also this idea of developing a friendship with uh, an artificial being. Is that something that we might feel? Are we able to feel empathy for uh, an avatar? And if so, how is that going to impact our daily life? And so there is this idea of um, creating this sort of um, call. Um, and we are also working with Brigitte in order to uh, think about some um, some other type of, uh, let's say, test 
uh, or experiments involve the interaction between uh, users and AI. And uh, of course, if you're interested in taking part in the project, just drop me an email and I will be more than happy to share with you, uh, you know, the ideas and how, how now we're going to further develop it in the future. 